Welcome back to part two of this video series on algorithms and algorithm analysis. In this second part, we introduce the idea of algorithms and the types of resources that they use and motivate why we want a formal framework by which we want to analyze algorithms. Finally, we introduce the concept of pseudocode and present several examples. An algorithm is a self-contained sequence of actions to be performed. Algorithms can perform calculations, process data, and automated reasoning tasks. This definition of an algorithm is a dictionary definition. In fact, I pulled this definition off of Wikipedia. It gives a good intuition as to what an algorithm is, but unfortunately it falls short in that it is an informal definition of what an algorithm is. If we really want to study algorithms and computation from a more rigorous mathematical point of view, we need a much more formal definition. One such mathematical definition is that of a Turing machine the concept of which is used in studies extensively in more formal computational models in computability theory and complexity theory. We won't go into the formal definition in this series, but you should at least be aware of it. A Turing machine is a mathematical model of a computer that has a finite read-only input tape, in which the input is assumed to be stored, and an infinite work tape. The machine is defined by its finite state control, which has a collection of states. In short, the machine is able to look at one bit of the input tape, one bit of the work tape, and then transition to a new state, optionally overriding what is stored in the work tape, and moving the two tape heads left or right or not at all. It turns out that even this extremely simple computational model is actually very powerful. This model is sufficient to compute anything that a normal computer program can. Certainly it's not as easy to program a Turing machine, it's certainly not as efficient as modern computers, but any valid algorithm that you can come up with has an equivalent Turing machine implementation. For the purposes of this series, however, the dictionary definition will be enough. There are many different types of algorithms. Most of the algorithms or programs that you've been exposed to have likely been of the first type, deterministic. This simply means that given the same input, a deterministic algorithm will perform the exact same operations if you run it multiple times. Randomized algorithms are algorithms that use some sort of random source to guide its computation either by creating and checking potential solutions or to make decisions. This is in contrast to deterministic algorithms, as randomized algorithms may have different behavior on different executions, even with the same input. Often algorithms are needed not just to find a solution, but the best solution, so as to maximize or minimize some benefit or cost. Some optimization problems can be solved exactly using deterministic algorithms. However, other more difficult problems may be more efficiently solved with an approximation algorithm or a heuristic. These are algorithms that may not necessarily find the absolute best solution, but which may instead find a solution that is close to the best solution. Often these sort of algorithms have a mathematical guarantee as to how close the produced solution will be to optimal. There are also parallel and distributed algorithms that attempt to solve a problem more efficiently using multiple computer cores or multiple independent computers. There are many more categories of types of algorithm, and each one of these is a research area in and of itself. For our purposes, we'll focus on deterministic algorithms, which are the most common and most likely that you're going to see. When we run algorithms, they may require or expend certain resources. From an engineering perspective, a computer system has a lot of different types of resources. The most obvious resource is time, which can be measured in actual execution time, measured in milliseconds, microseconds, etc., or you can measure it in terms of CPU cycles, or steps or instructions, which may vary depending on the speed of your processor. Other resources may include how much memory is required by the algorithm to compute its result. You may even consider memory reads or writes independently, as in some applications one is faster than the other. Another common resource measure is power consumption. In a lot of situations, cell phones and other mobile devices, for example, we may be willing to sacrifice speed if we can decrease the amount of power required to execute a program. Most people would prefer a smartphone whose battery lasted twice as long versus one that had twice the processing power. Networking often uses bandwidth or throughput as its basic resource measure. Computation time may pale in comparison to the latency in a network connection. When considering embedded systems or low-level hardware, Resources can be measured in terms of the number of gates or wires that are required to implement a particular circuitry. This correlates nicely with power consumption and circuit size. You could also measure resources in terms of wasted resources. An expensive system may not be worth the money that we pay for it if it ends up not being used as much as it could be. This is one of the main drivers of modern virtualization. 
Nobody needs a full physical server to serve a small or even medium scale static web app or web page. Virtualization allows us to run dozens of virtual machines on one piece of physical hardware, thus increasing utilization and reducing idleness. Resource measures may also be in terms of peak usages. Often systems experience bursts of high activity and demand. We may want to consider this type of variable resource cost and plan accordingly. Regardless of the type of the resource that we want to engineer for, we generally want efficient solutions. This means that we want to minimize the amount of resources a particular algorithm requires. In practical applications, this may mean that we have a trade-off. We could trade speed for lower power consumption, or vice versa. Many data structures such as hash tables trade performance, that is time, for memory. These are all very practical and important issues. However, these are engineering problems, not algorithmic problems. When we design and implement a real system, then these questions become relevant and important. However, we want to study algorithms in and of themselves. Given an algorithm, we want to know what its inherent complexity is. For this reason, we want a general and abstract framework for algorithm analysis. This analysis needs to be invariant and independent of any particular resource cost. Just because computers become faster and cheaper doesn't mean that the algorithms that we run on them suddenly become magically more efficient. Faster computers means that we can execute an algorithm faster on the same input or in the same amount of time on larger inputs. We don't want our theoretical analysis to be tied to any particular resource because those resources can change. Algorithms don't. We could always upgrade our hardware or switch languages or any number of other changes could be made, but the algorithm would still stay the same. A quintessential example of this is the old, one of the oldest algorithms, Euclid's greatest common divisor algorithm. This algorithm is over 2300 years old, far before the advent of the modern computer. It takes just as many operations and steps to execute Euclid's GCD algorithm today as it did over 2000 years ago. Implementing and running this algorithm on a modern computer just means that the individual steps are faster, not that the algorithm itself is any faster. The reason that we want an abstract general and invariant framework to analyze algorithms is because we want to answer questions such as the following. Given two algorithms that solve the same problem, which one performs better? Given a choice of data structure to use on an algorithm, which one performs best? As we increase the input sizes, how will the algorithm's performance scale? These questions would all have very different and perhaps misleading answers if we only looked at empirical performance on a particular system. A generally slower algorithm may outperform a generally faster one on any particular machine say a system that offered special optimization features for that particular problem. Since we don't want our analysis tied to any particular system, we also don't want our algorithmic descriptions to be tied to any particular language. We need a general way to describe steps in an algorithm without being encumbered by the particulars of a programming language. To do that, we use pseudocode. Pseudo here meaning fake. Pseudocode is not a method, function, or snippet of code, or even a full program. Instead, it's a code-like description of a process. There are no specific set rules for writing pseudocode. If there were, then it would be an actual programming language that we could compile and run. However, there are several best practices when writing pseudocode. Good pseudocode clearly labels the input and output and uses descriptive variable names similar to good coding style guidelines. Unlike code, however, you can make good use of plain old English. After all, pseudocode is intended to be read and understood by humans, not machines. You can and should utilize standard mathematical notation when appropriate. Good pseudocode does not rely on any language-specific syntax or constructs. It gives the essential and necessary details of the process, enough so that a competent programmer could translate your pseudocode to a high-level programming language that they're already familiar with. Good pseudocode also omits unnecessary details anything from variable declarations to full data structure implementations. To understand the art of pseudocode, we'll look at a couple of examples. I've used a typesetting system called LaTeX and a LaTeX package called Algorithm2e to produce these examples. Our first example is pretty simple. It's an algorithm to find the maximal element in a collection. At the top of the pseudocode, we've clearly labeled the input and the output. This is also an opportunity to state any assumptions about the input. In this case, we've declared that it's a collection, it's finite, and we've given its cardinality a variable, n. We've also used generic variables and elements. We haven't specified that a is a set, an array, linked list, or any particular data structure, nor have we said that it's a collection of numbers or strings or anything else. This keeps the algorithm general. 
We've also used one indexing instead of the usual zero indexing that you're probably used to. Zero indexing is an artifact of how memory and indexing works, works in a computer, but mathematics usually uses one indexing, so we've used it here. We've used a generic assignment operator using a left arrow. A lot of programming languages use a single equal sign as the assignment operator, but some don't. Haskell and Maple are two prime examples. We've also used math notation throughout the algorithm, including set notations. There's a lack of rigid bracket structure to define code blocks. Instead, we've used indentation and these vertical lines to indicate nested blocks. There's also a lack of syntactical punctuation, such as semicolons. These are all artifacts of programming languages, which we want to avoid in our pseudocode. Again, we emphasize that there are no fixed rules for pseudocode, and you may be able to write good pseudocode using alternative styles. The main point of pseudocode is that it clearly conveys each significant step of an algorithm. Here's another example where we compute the mean of a collection of numbers. In this example, we're more specific that A contains numbers, since the mean is not well defined for other types. We make use of common Greek letters used in math. We avoid the syntactic sugar that we're used to in programming languages. We can write fractions mathematically, something that ASCII-based code would not allow. A bad example is also helpful. Here we've tried to write pseudocode to sort a collection of numbers, but we've made it too trivial. In general, we should use plain English when possible, but we've trivialized the purpose of pseudocode by not describing the essential details here. How should we sort the elements? We should note, however, that this line would be perfectly fine if we were using sorting as a sub-step in another algorithm. Here's an example. To find the median element, we sort the elements first, then we retrieve the middle element. The main purpose of this algorithm is not to sort, but uses sorting as a subroutine to accomplish another task. It is perfectly fine in this example to omit the details of how to sort, and put those details into another algorithm. This is very similar to how you might modularize code by separating out chunks into their own functions and methods, so that they can be reused and essential details are hidden via procedural abstraction. Here's our final example, where we do provide the necessary details to sort a collection. This is selection sort, which you've probably seen before. To recap, it sorts by selecting the minimal element in the collection and swapping it with the first element. It repeats this process for each index value i starting from 1 up to n minus 1. Line 6 omits the usual details of storing one value into a temporary variable. In contrast, we could replace the code blocks on lines 3 through 5 with something like find the minimum among the a sub i plus 1 through a sub n elements. However, that would be obfuscating some of those essential details. Pseudocode is going to be a balance between being too terse and too verbose.